This is a picture of the surface of gold metal made with a scanning tunneling microscope. Each of these fuzzy spheres on the surface is a single atom of gold. This picture is a phenomenal confirmation of our understanding of matter. STM technology was developed in the 1980s and offered our first real glimpse of the atom. But the concept of the atom as a fundamental building block of nature has been around since the ancient Greeks. Early chemists in the 1800s picked up on this Greek idea to help explain their observations of matter. Its existence has been confirmed again and again by indirect evidence, the way elements combine and interact with nature. But it's only been relatively recently that we have this more direct confirmation of atoms in the form of STM pictures. In this PowerPoint, we're going to explore Dalton's theory of the atom. This is one of the first cohesive theories of how atoms make up matter, and it was developed in the early 1800s. Its basic postulates still provide a useful way of understanding how matter is structured on the microscopic level today. The first postulate of Dalton's theory is that matter is composed of exceedingly small particles called atoms. These are the smallest unit of an element that participates in a chemical change. Here's another STM picture, this time of the carbon atoms found in graphite, which is the same substance you'll find in your pencil lead. And this picture gives you an idea of the scale of the atoms. The black line in the corner represents 0.5 nanometers. And 0.5 nanometers is the equivalent of 5 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. So this is extremely tiny. Imagine making a tiny dot on a piece of paper with your pencil. How many carbon atoms do you think transferred to the paper in that dot? It turns out that atoms are so small that even in that tiny dot, you'll find 500 trillion carbon atoms. So the second part of Dalton's atomic theory is that an element consists of only one type of atom, which has a mass that is characteristic of that element and is the same for all atoms of that element. So if you consider copper, one of the primary elements found in a penny, Dalton's theory states that all the atoms of copper in that penny are identical to each other. We actually now know that this is not completely true as Dalton stated it. It turns out that there can be small variations in mass between those atoms of copper. These are called isotopes. However, all the other properties of those atoms of copper are still identical and the average atomic mass of those isotopes is characteristic of the element still. The third part of Dalton's theory is that atoms of one element differ in properties from atoms of all other elements. So consider the differences between the two elements, gold and carbon. One is a malleable metal that can be worked into shapes like these gold bars. It's relatively inert as well, meaning it really doesn't react with much in nature. Carbon, on the other hand, here shown in the form of graphite, is a brittle solid that breaks easily, at least in this form. It's actually much more commonly found combined with other elements in nature because its atoms are much more likely to react than gold atoms. And this points to the fundamental nature of this postulate from Dalton's theory. The properties of these elements are different because the atoms that make them up are different. The fourth postulate of Dalton's theory is that a compound consists of atoms of two or more elements combined in a small whole number ratio. In a given compound, the number of atoms of each of its elements are always present in the same ratio. So consider the compound copper two oxide. This is a powdery black substance made up of the elements copper and oxygen. When broken down into those elements, it's found that they are always present in the same ratio. In terms of atoms, this is one copper atom for every one oxygen atom. Related to this is Dalton's last postulate. Atoms are neither created nor destroyed during a chemical change, but instead rearranged to yield substances that are different from those present before the change. You may recognize this as a restatement of the law of conservation of matter. Dalton based his theory on his observations as well as those of other chemists at the time, such as Antoine Lavoisier, a French chemist who stated the law of conservation of matter based on careful measurements of masses before and after a chemical change. Dalton simply restated it in terms of the atoms involved. This picture shows that rearrangement of atoms. 
On the left, the elements copper, shown here as brown spheres, and oxygen, shown here as red spheres, are uncombined with each other. They're separate. And they each have distinct properties associated with those elements. Copper is a shiny red-brown solid, while oxygen is a clear colorless gas. When they react, their atoms rearrange to form a compound that is black and powdery, copper two oxide. The copper and oxygen atoms don't disappear. They are still present in the compound, but they're combined in a new way that produces a substance with completely different properties than the elements that make it up. Dalton also based his theory on the work of another French chemist at the time, Joseph Proust. Joseph Proust put forth the law of constant composition, or also known as the law of definite proportions. This states that all samples of a pure compound contain the same elements in the same proportion by mass. Proust formulated this law after doing many careful mass measurements of the elemental composition of a variety of different substances. And he found that regardless of what sample he started with, as long as the samples were of the same compound, they would always produce the same mass ratio of elements. So let's look at an example of this with data from the compound isooctane. Isooctane is made up of two elements, carbon and hydrogen. In sample A, we separate the compound into these two elements and measure the mass of each. 14.82 grams of carbon were recovered and 2.78 grams of hydrogen. If we take the ratio of these masses, we find that it will reduce down to 5.33 grams of carbon for every one gram of hydrogen. Now let's take a second sample, also of isooctane. So in sample B, we end up getting 22.33 grams of carbon and 4.19 grams of hydrogen. So our absolute masses are larger, but when we take the ratio of those two masses, again, we find that it reduces to 5.33 grams of carbon for every one gram of hydrogen. And we see the same thing in our third sample, sample C. This time we isolate 19.4 grams of carbon and 3.64 grams of hydrogen. The ratio of these two masses, though, still gives us 5.33 grams of carbon for every one gram of hydrogen. So this works for every compound. It doesn't matter where it came from or how much we start with. As long as we're looking at samples of the same compound, we will always find the same ratio of elements. This is the law of constant composition. Dalton used Proust's law, as well as his own observations of mass relationships, to formulate one last important law using his atomic theory. This is the law of multiple proportions, and it states that when two elements react to form more than one compound, a fixed mass of one element will react with masses of the other element in a ratio of small whole numbers. Another way of stating this is that different compounds of the same elements have different fixed whole number ratios of atoms. Let me show you how this works. So copper and chlorine can be found in two different compounds. One is a green powdery substance, the other brown. When these compounds are analyzed for their mass ratio of chlorine to copper, it's found that the green substance always reduces to a ratio of 0.588 grams of chlorine for every one gram of copper, while the brown one always reduces to 1.116 grams of chlorine for every one gram of copper. Different unique ratios of the elements for different compounds. Now Dalton found something very interesting if he took a ratio of these two mass ratios. So outlined in this box in red is the mass ratio of the second compound divided by the mass ratio of the first compound. These two ratios can actually reduce to another simple whole number ratio. It turns out it reduces to 2 to 1. 
Dalton used this relationship to infer that there was twice as much chlorine in the second compound as there was in the first. This was the basis of determining the chemical formulas of these compounds as ratios of atoms. So the first compound is a one-to-one -one ratio of copper and chlorine, while the second compound is a one-to-two ratio. Another way of stating the law of multiple portions is that different compounds of the same elements have different fixed whole number ratios of atoms. So in summary, we still use much of Dalton's theory today. It's very useful to help explain differences we see in many different forms of matter on the atomic level.